This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you episode 42 of season 2 of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in Ayer a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, October 16, 1909. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford in 1909. The first section is the Westford Center section. Miss Alice Howard, who graduated from Simmons College this last June as a trained librarian, has accepted a position in Cotuit, where she will have a charge of the library, substituting and assisting, and her many friends wish her much success and pleasure in her new surroundings. Mrs. John McIntosh, who is still at her home with typhoid fever, is reported as doing well. The Grange has sent the usual beautiful bouquet of flowers through its flora, that's capital F-L-O-R-A, and the visiting committee were reminded of their family duties of fraternal sympathy. Uh, Flora was one of the Grange officers named for the Roman goddess of flowers. And apparently the responsibility of that office was to send flowers and and possibly provide flowers for meetings. Miss Edith... I'm sorry, Miss Edith Wright has been having an unexpected vacation from her school duties at Ayer. Owing to the prevalence of diphtheria, the school was closed and she spent last week at her home here. George W. Haywood observed the 80th milestone in his journey of life quietly at his home Sunday. The day was made uh, memorable by having his only daughter, Miss Elizabeth Hildreth, and her husband, and his only grandson, Roger Haywood Hildreth, aged just four weeks, to dine with him. It was little Roger's first journey from home. Uh, George W. was, uh, the W. was for Washington, George Washington Haywood. Mrs. Elliot Atwood and daughter, Miss Jessie, were guests in town and attendants at the Congregational Church Sunday. The H.V. Hildreths enjoyed one more weekend at camp. The summer-like weather and the beautiful autumn foliage around the shores of the pond made their stay quite worthwhile. Arthur Wilson and Miss Florence Wilson are enjoying a trip to Washington. Mrs. Carey and May Atwood made a pilgrimage to Methuen Wednesday of this week, which was the home of their maternal grandparents. Those who have horse chestnut trees about their homes have a positively bumper crop this fall. To the person who could find some really practical use for these glossy brown nuts, a good profit might be realized. I don't think everybody uh, claimed that anybody ever claimed that prize. Donald M. Cameron has been painting the buildings and making other improvements at the family homestead. Uh, This was the house at 63 Main Street, just west of Rodenbush Community Center, that was built by him in 1893, and the top of which was destroyed by fire a few weeks, a few uh, years ago. The next section is the Westford Grange section. Conferring of first and second degrees was the program scheduled for the first meeting in October, but owing to the fact that there is no class for initiation this fall, the program for the evening was a miscellaneous one. It was, devo- it was voted by the members to conduct a lecture and entertainment course for a fourth season. The committee in charge of this course consists of Reverend Charles P. Marshall, Samuel L. Taylor, and the master and lecturer Al- Alonzo H. Sutherland and Edson G. Boynton. This committee again bespeaks the hearty cooperation and patronage of those outside the Grange as well as the members. The object is to give the public a good, bright course of six entertainments and lectures, as is possible with the amount raised and not as any source of revenue to the Grange. The committee's achievements in financing last season will be remembered. The cost of the excellent course given was $168 and some cents, and it turned into the Grange Treasury at the close of the course exactly three cents after all bills were paid. 
The program Thursday evening consisted of selections by the Grange Orchestra with encores, recitation by Mrs. Elva Nelson, reading by Mrs. Sutherland and Mr. Marshall, after which there was some practical discussion of a timely subject, corn and potato culture. The members of Westford Grange made the visitation of Tingsboro Grange, for which they had been planning and keep preparing for some time, the special object being the conferring of the third degree by the ladies' degree staff. Every member of the staff was able to go and act well her part. Also invited was the Grange Orchestra, who did well and were much appreciated. Two barges, one in charge of Fred Smith and the other of William E. Wright, and single teams conveyed the delegation, numbering fully 50 in all. The next paragraph is entitled Concert. Edwin N. C. Barnes gave a song recital at the town hall last week, Friday evening, of most excellent merit, consisting of sea songs chosen from a great number received by him from English publishers while in London this past summer. Mr. Barnes was admirably assisted by Master Joseph Gewitz, G-E-W-I-T-Z, boy violinist, Miss Bernice F. Wright, reader, and Miss E. Marion Sweat, accompanist. Master Gewitz was heartily applauded for his skillful and sympathetic interpretation of difficult selections. Miss Wright was charming and dignified, and all her numbers were well received. Miss Sweat is well known as an accompanist of ability, and her work from Friday evening was of her, of her usual high standard. Next is the Tadmuck Club section. The first meeting of the Tadmuck Club for its fourth season of work together assembled in the vestry of the Unitarian Church Tuesday afternoon. The pleasant parlors were bright with sunshine and well-arranged autumn flowers. The club starts the year auspiciously with the limit of a membership of 75 reached. There have been a few withdrawals owing to absence from town and ill health, but these vacancies have all been filled. New members added are Miss Edith M. Lawrence, Miss Elizabeth R. Cushing, Miss Winifred Burnham, and Mrs. A. H. Sutherland. Uh, that limit on, mem on membership was gradually increased until it uh, was well over a hundred uh, by the by 1920 or so. Miss Loker, Loker, who has always been the club's choice of president, gave words of welcome and greeting, calling attention to the outside program for the year and to the printed constitutions for each member, and voiced the wish of enlargement of scope for the organization and the line of town betterment, etc. The program for the afternoon was Vacation Experiences in charge of Mrs. William A. Woodward. Mrs. Benjamin H. Bailey gave the first paper, which was exceedingly interesting and witty, reminiscent of vacation weeks in Dedham. Miss Miranda Luce gave vacation experiences right at home in which she used her happy gift of telling them in verse. Miss Gertrude D. Fletcher had prepared a scholarly and instructive paper read by Miss Clara Smith of her recent trip to Montreal and Quebec. Interspersed at this point was a piano duet by Mrs. Marshall and Miss Julia Fletcher, which was followed by a sketch by Miss Clara Smith of summer days spent in ancient Duxbury, redolent of tradition of the old, col old colony days. Miss Loker closed the afternoon's program with an account of enjoyable days spent at Burlington during the Tercentary uh, Lake Champlain celebration. So that must have been Burlington, Vermont. The next section is the About Town section. Reverend P. H. Creasy of Groton will conduct the services at the Unitarian Church next Sunday in exchange with Reverend Benjamin H. Bailey. Mrs. James H. O'Brien on the Pigeon Hill branch of the Stony Brook Road, who has been quite ill, is now enough better to stay better. She's enough better to stay better. Uh, the Pigeon Hill area of Stony Brook Road was the home of several Irish families uh, in this time period, notably Sheehan, O'Brien, Flynn, and Horan families. Among the marriages of interest to Brookside and Westford Corner residents will be that of Lincoln A. Reddick and Miss Ellen Knowles. Mr. Reddick will be rem remembered as a brother of Mrs. Edward Moore. 
For many years, he was connected with the Brookside Mills as washman and otherwise, besides serving the town as constable for several years. Miss Knowles is the daughter of John H. Knowles, for many years night watchman at the Brookside Mills, but more recently the storekeeper at Marshall's Hall at Westford Corner. Since the death of Horace Hamlet, the holder of the gold-headed cane, as the oldest citizen of the town, the question naturally comes up for an answer. Who next in the old age list to, pos to possess the cane? There is good authority for believing that Matthew F. Downs, corner of Groton and Dunstable Road, will be the next in line of possession. He is well in his 80s, besides being well, although not as gray as many of a younger day. Uh, he lived in the old brick tavern on Groton Road uh, at that corner. The Board of Registration of Voters will hold a meeting at Forge Village, Abbott's Hall, Monday evening, October 18th, from 7.30 to 9, and at Graniteville, Healy's Hall, next Wednesday evening, from 7.30 to 9. Joseph T. Richardson is helping along the prosperity of the Cold Spring Farm at the intersection of Depot Street and Cold Spring Road in tilling the soil and by other useful maneuvers. John H. Decatur, who has had years of illness measured into him, had a condensed illustration served on him Tuesday evening. At present, he is better, but not up to his former self in the sunny, helpful days of illness. The seller for the new house of John O. Sunberg of Brookside is already advanced enough to give an impression of the exterior design of the house. Wilbert E. Parsons has resigned the office of Inspector of Meat, to which he was appointed by the selectmen on account of, con of contemplated removal from town. The next section is entitled, Dedicated. Thomas H. Elliott, who lives in Lowell, pays taxes in Westford, and goes to church in Littleton, has dedicated for the present the Neshoba Schoolhouse, uh, located at what is now one land's end off of Concord Road, which he bought of the town to a better observance of the Sabbath, better and larger and larger thought and character. With this end in view, he has invited the Baptist Society of Littleton to hold religious services in the schoolhouse Sunday afternoons, and they have accepted the invitation. Mr. Elliott will be remembered as a well-known influence in the Middlesex North Conference of the Unitarian Churches and in the denomination generally. But like Paul of old, he is willing, quote, to be all things to all men, if by all means he can save some, end quote, which is a quote from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. The next paragraph is called Annual Meeting. The trustees of Middlesex North Agricultural Society held its annual meeting at Lowell Tuesday. Only where vacancies occurred, the old board of officers were re-elected. A report of the recent fair at Chelmsford was made, showing a net income of $300. Among those present was J. Lewis Ellsworth, Secretary of the State Board of Agriculture, who announced that the State Board would hold its winter meeting in Lowell, or Grange Hall, Dracut. Noted speakers will be present and address the meetings, which will be held over three days, commencing December 7th. The next section is Graniteville. Little Genevieve Healy, the three-year-old daughter of Mr. and Mrs. William H. Healy of this village, took first prize at the baby show held in North Chelmsford last Saturday afternoon. Little Russell Dudevoy, the 10 months old son of Mr. and Mrs. Charles Dudevoy, of this village also received a prize. I think that's uh, misspelled. It's spelled D-U-D-E-V-O-I-X. I think it's D-U-R, Durdevoy. The next section is a paragraph on uh, football. The North Chelmsford football, football Club visited here last Saturday afternoon and met the Granite Field 
Graniteville Athletic Club in the first game of the season at Hillside Park. The North Chelmsford boys won by the score of 5 to nothing. Graniteville presented a much lighter team than their opponents, but played a plucky game throughout. North Chelmsford scored after six minutes of play. Lavelle, after a neat run of 25 yards, making the touchdown. Graniteville held them from scoring, from further scoring during the half. In the second half, Graniteville was somewhat reinforced by two new men, while the North Chelmsford boys made similar changes in their lineup. From the call of the whistle, the play was fast and furious, and there were several mix-ups which were due more to lack of knowledge of the game than with an intention to injure a fellow player. Both sides took things in a good-natured way and were of the opinion that it was, quote, all in the game, end quote. Neither side scored in this half, although Skolan, S-C-O-L-L-A-N, the sprinter, made a fine run of 35 yards and but for the foul made by Pope would have scored a touchdown. The ball was returned and both sides put up a game battle, but the half ended soon after with the ball in midfield. When the game terminated, both sides sized each other up, counted the bruises made in the conflict, shook hands naturally, 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 and decided to meet again in two weeks at North Chelmsford. Apparently, in 1909, a touchdown was only worth five points if the, if the paper was correct in reporting the score as five to nothing. The next section is the Forge Village section. What came near being a very serious accident took place Sunday afternoon when the 530 electric car bound for air struck Adolphus Blowy, the youngest son of Mr. and Mrs. Samuel Blowy. The little boy was playing on the road while waiting for his mother, who, with her sister, Miss Elizabeth Orange, went to the cemetery in the afternoon and was expected on that car. When the accident occurred, he was quickly carried into the house, and Dr. Cyril A. Blaney, who was in the village, called to attend him. He received some cuts on his leg, and two toes were broken. Conductor Walter Blodgett was in charge of the car. Upon learning of the accident, Superintendent Cushing came right down on the next car to see about it. The little boy, although only three years old, is doing as well as can be expected. Uh, he was actually only two years old, uh, two years and about nine months. He was born January 2nd, 1907. The infant daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Charles Blodgett was christened at St. Andrew's Mission Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock by Reverend Thomas L. Fisher. Mrs. Chester Blodgett and Miss Annie, Miss Annie and Charles Blodgett were sponsors. Florence Ann was the name given to the little one. The Christian robe was of Irish linen and sent from Oldham, England. Mr. and Mrs. Blodgett reside at the Ridges, uh, which is in Groton, out West Prescott Street, I believe. Wilbert E. Parsons has moved his furniture store from Central Street to Prescott Street and sometime in the future will remodel it into a tenement house. I believe Prescott Street is, well, well Central Street was uh, what we call West Prescott Street now. And Prescott Street was also called Union Street between uh, Forge Village and Graniteville. The Forge, Village, the Forge Village Tigers play the Littleton Wanderers on the home grounds Saturday afternoon and were defeated by a score of 20 to 8. I presume that was a football game. Uh, the annual meeting of St. Andrew's Parish was held at the Vicarage Monday evening. 25 were present from this village. After the business of the evening was over, a social hour was passed when sandwiches and coffee were served by the Ladies Guild of Ayr. Uh, St. Andrew's uh, Parish in Ayr was the host church or the home church for St. Andrew's Mission in Forge Village. Miss Rachel Cherry, Cherry of this village has received a very interesting letter from her brother, Edwin Cherry, chief steward on the yacht Privateer. His boat led the 3rd Division of the Hudson Fulton Parade. They entertained Admiral Sir Charles Seymour and several other distinguished officers of the British fleet. 
the Hudson Fulton Parade was in New York City and was a gala celebration held in 1909 to commemorate the discovery of the Hudson River in September 1609 by Henry Hudson, who died two years later, and the sailing of the first commercial steamship between New York City and Albany by Robert Fulton in 1807. He died in 1815. The recent warm weather brought many visitors to Forge Pond last week, uh, the last of, of the week, and Sunday, many who closed their cottages opened them again to enjoy those beautiful October days. And that's the news in Westford for the week ending October 16th, 1909. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from, from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.